Thank you. Good morning. Um, I think my talk is just a little bit of an introduction to everybody else's talk, so I'm looking forward to hearing what the rest of the panel also has to say. Oh, that's another one. Oh, there. Sorry. These are my disclosures. Okay, so the Holy Plain uh, was first characterized by Dr. Bill Heald in the 1980s, especially with his work with uh, total mesorectal excision and its relationship to local recurrence rates. And so he really had three basic premises. So number one, that there was mobility in the tissues that came from different embryologic origins. Number two, that you should really be doing sharp dissection under direct visualization. And number three, that with gentle traction, these planes could be separated uh, without tearing. With this technique, he was able to decrease local recurrence rates uh, to 3.7%, which at the time was really unheard of. And when done correctly, there is an unblock resection of all the lymph node bearing tissue in the mesorectum, <clears throat> including the enveloping fascia um, as one, and then with the autonomic nerves left intact. So several studies did show that with total mesorectal excision, your recurrence rates could go from 20 to 45% down to less than 10%. So these studies published um, showed that. However, there were other studies that um, continued to show local recurrence rates of 11 to 19%. So looking at this variation in the recurrence rates with a total mesorectal excision kind of made us question, you know, maybe not all TMEs are created equally. So let's fast forward a few years. So this is a na um, National Cancer Database study from 2010 to 2011, um, and it looked at rectal cancer patients. So they were looking at the rate of positive circumferential margin, and they looked at characteristics such as patient demographics, tumor characteristics, and treatment. And they did find that certain characteristics like T3, T4, high grade, and kind of your usual lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion, were all independently associated with a positive margin. But other things like geography were also associated with a positive margin. Neoadjuvant chemoradiation uh, was not associated uh, with margin status, and in this cohort, about 17% of the patients had a positive circumferential margin. So definitely there's room for improvement. <clears throat> and so because of this variability, um, the, the NAPRC was born. So there was a, several, actually a lot of surgeons who were under the Ostrich Consortium combined with the American College Commission on Cancer formed the NAPRC as a way to improve rectal cancer, cancer care. And the purpose of it is to ensure that patients with rectal cancer, with rectal cancer are receiving multidisciplinary care. And so the program really has four pillars program structure, patient care processes, performance improvement, and performance measures. So part of the program is a TME evaluation. And so there are four photographs that are taken, anterior, posterior, and then two lateral photographs. And together with pathology, these are reviewed at your multidisciplinary uh, tumor board. And it really is a good chance to get feedback and help you improve on your uh, TME specimen. And it's really not supposed to be a punitive process. It really is an opportunity to learn from your dissection and learn from your peers what you can do better to improve your TME specimen. So synoptic reporting is also part of this process. And what the synoptic reports really do is it helps aid the discussion so that you know that you're looking at all the same things together. <clears throat> so these are some of the elements of the TME specimen that should really be looked at. The College of American Pathologists have put this together, that in addition to TNN stage, you should also include an evaluation, a macroscopic evaluation of your mesorectum. <clears throat> Excuse me. So was it incomplete, complete, or near complete? And things that would make something complete would be a bulky mesorectum with a smooth surface, no defects greater than five millimeters in depth, <clears throat> and really looking at this as, as kind of your quality metric. Um, there's no coning at the distal edges, 
and then after transverse sectioning, there should be a smooth circumferential margin to evaluate. <clears throat> Part of the evaluation also includes your circumferential and radial margin. And it's really believed that these three elements probably link the closest to, technical, to, te to technique. <clears throat> so what can we learn from other disciplines? So this is an interesting study on um, energy use. <clears throat> so in this study, they're looking at feedback. And so we all know that we need feedback to learn. And in, com in combination with social norms, it really can be a powerful agent of change. So what is a social norm? So essentially a social norm is kind of a fancy way of saying how things should be done in combination with a little bit of peer pressure. So in this study, <clears throat> it's about 300 households um, in California. And what they did is that they gave all the households information about how much electricity they had used in the last several weeks. And then they gave them the average use for, the for their neighborhood. And so that they could compare themselves, were they high users or low users? And so what they found that in the weeks after their report, the people who were high users of energy decreased their energy use, and the people that were low users of energy, instead of staying low, however, increased their energy use. So that was kind of an unexpected finding. And so what can we do so that everybody moves in the right direction? And so as part of the study, they had a second cohort where not only did they tell them how much energy they used, they used emoticons. And so if you were a household that used more than average energy, you were told you use more than average, but then you were given a sad emoticon in your report. If you were a household that used less than average, you were then giving a happy emoticon. So what do you guys think happened with the addition of the emoticons? Well, <clears throat> if you were a household that used a lot of energy, and you were told that you used a lot of energy and you were given a sad emoticon, you had a significantly uh, decreased amount of energy used. If you were a household that used low amounts of energy and you were only given the description that you were a low user, you kind of went up. But if you were given the happy emoticon, you stayed as a low energy user. So human behavior is kind of strange. But interestingly in this study, the emoticons really did make a difference. So what can we learn from that? Well, during your TME evaluation, if you get a, you know, a complete specimen, then you can get your description that you have a complete specimen, and then you can also get a happy emoticon so you can continue your good behavior. Okay, so I'm gonna pivot a little bit uh, just to talk about stoma rates and uh, sphinc sphincter preservation. So this is a study um, in the US, 21 states, um, that looked at hospital discharge data. And they looked at over 20,000 proctectomies, about half of them were APRs. And what you can see here is that um, less than 20% of the counties had a stoma rate of less than 40%. Additionally, they looked at uh, the counties, and there were some counties that had a lot higher rates than others. So the reddish ones um, higher, the purple ones lower, and just really seeing that depending on where you lived and where you got your care could either increase or decrease your chance of uh, getting a stoma for the rest of your life. So <clears throat> this study is actually a Canadian study. So it was looking at um, 10 hospitals in a single province in Canada uh, between 2002 and 2006 and it included 466 patients. 48% uh, were permanent colostomies, and what they found was that some of the factors that led to a permanent colostomy were male sex, low tumor height, and increased tumor stage. So all things that we would probably agree with. But look at the graph. So there's significant variation across the 10 hospitals within that same province. And so the authors went back and said, okay, so let's say that an appropriate colostomy has a couple of factors. So if there's invasion of the sphincter, yes, probably that person should get a colostomy. If the tumor is less than six centimeters from the anal verge, or if there is some other reason the person needs a permanent colostomy, they categorize those all as appropriate. In this cohort, 64 patients, or about 29%, didn't fit any of that criteria. So the authors questioned whether these were appropriate stomas. I think looking at the data, it's uh, difficult to make that conclusion that these were inappropriate, but I think that we can all agree 
that that much variation probably shouldn't exist given that their baseline characteristics were actually all very, very similar. So this is a population-based study from the Netherlands. So this uh, data is from 2009 to 2016 and over 20,000 patients. So they had some regression analysis and models and they were looking at the chance that you would get a sphincter-preserving operation um, given your tumor location. <clears throat> and so they, their median observed pres uh, sphincter preservation rate for low cancers was 29.3%, 75.6% for mid, and 87.9% uh, for high. And what they found that after they um, did case mix index adjustments, et cetera, the hospital surgery was a significant factor um, for all three locations. Um, but there was no significant association between hospital volume in high and low cancers. So really the main factor was which hospital did you get your surgery at? And so in summary, total mesorectal excision is an important quality metric. Feedback on TME is important for continuous improvement. Synoptic Im uh, reporting and photographs really aid with that and they are part of the NAPRC program. Variation exists in quality of TME and in the rates of sphincter preservation. Thank you so much. Happy to take questions at the end. Thank you.